On hearing this teaching, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. So we are in this series on following Jesus' way in discipleship. Discipleship is, is simply to follow and, and to learn. Two weeks ago, we, we looked at Jesus' call on a Peter from this same gospel, from the gospel of John. Uh, Peter was given a new identity. Peter, at that juncture, was invited to say yes to Jesus as the Lamb of God, as his rabbi, as the Messiah. And in the process of saying yes to Jesus this way, he learned some things about who he was, his identity, that he's a sinner who needs a Lamb of God, that he's someone who needs to learn from this rabbi, this teacher, Jesus, that he is someone naturally rebellious to the ways of God's kingdom, who needs a king and a messiah. See, disciples will have our identity in forgiveness, in learning, in humble obedience to the kingdom. Now, the next juncture that Peter came up to last week was that uh, his call to take a risk, stepping out of the boat. Disciples keep their attention on Jesus in the face of their fears when the waters and the winds come up on them. And today, today the next risky step that Jesus is calling his disciples to is to continue to follow in the face of a hard teaching. Continuing to choose to listen when the words that are being heard are difficult words to hear. And what calls us, the one who calls us in that res risky next step in the story today, it was Jesus himself. For us today, as we hear the words of God, we hear them in the Gospels and uh, also in the collection of the words of God that we call the Bible, that we call the Scriptures. And at this juncture, the, the question is, do we continue to follow when faced with one of those hard sayings, hard teachings, or do we turn away? And what causes that turn? If you look in John 60, uh, uh, not 60, that would be a trick. There is no such thing as John 60. But if you can find it, you let me know. If you look in John 6, right, you'll, you'll hear their reaction to Jesus' teaching. And I love this. This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? They literally say in the original language, who can hear it? Who can hear it? This is a hard teaching. We heard earlier in the psalm, the reading from the psalm, the, um, the discussion, the call, do not, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. In the guidebook for this week, we look further at this same psalm, the same incident that happened at Meribah from the reading from Exodus that we heard earlier is referred to again in the, in the letter, the sermon to the Hebrews. And it's this same call. Today, if you hear your vo his voice, don't harden your hearts. It's not that they didn't understand the teaching. They didn't say this is an indecipherable teaching. 
Who can understand it? They said this is a hard teaching. Who can hear it? There's a lot of times where Jesus came up with a hard teaching, a difficult teaching. And in this time, as well as other times, his disciples, the ones who followed him, grumbled. They complained. When you hear the grumbling here, think about those Israelites, how they grumbled in the wilderness, right? It, it, it clues us in that there's some kind of, there's some testing involved with his teaching. They've hit a juncture. And Jesus makes it clear they've hit a juncture. Because Jesus, I love this about Jesus. He doesn't just stand around letting them all complain, right? right, right, right. He just calls them on it. What? Is this, is, is this what, in our translation, it says, does this offend you? Let me tell you about this. I just learned this this week, and I'm, and I'm loving this. So this, this, in the original language, this word for offend is this word scandalon. It, it, we have a really hard time translating it. It shows up in passages that talk about teachings or words that trip people up, right? Jesus has talked about the, the stone that the builders rejected, right? People trip up over Jesus being the Messiah. Well, what a scandal on was, I never knew this until this week. It was, a short, it was a stick that you would use in a bird trap. So there'd be a bird trap, and the stick would hold it open. And when the bird went in and sat on the stick or moved the stick, right, they triggered the trap, and they were, and they were stuck. They were in the box, right? The scandal on was the trigger. Jesus just looked at him and said, so did that just trigger you? And you should laugh because it's like our current language has finally caught up with ancient Greek. In all my life, I've looked at this word and I'm like, I don't think I actually understand that word. And then when I heard that word picture, I'm like, oh, I get it. We have this now. We talk about people being triggered and in its best use, it's a really compassionate term. It comes from the recognition that there are people who have been through trauma and traumatic situations. And certain words, certain phrases are going to trigger them, are going to restore that, are going to bring them emotionally right back into that trauma. In our urban slang, in our urban dictionary now, we've taken what started out as a fairly helpful word for people who have PTSD or who have had traumatic situations, and now we just talk about people being triggered, right? Oh, is that a hard one for you? You triggered there? Are you triggered there? You, have you run across this? Do you know what I'm talking about? Or are you just too embarrassed to laugh at me? <laughs> okay, you know what we're talking about. Um, so, so, and I just love this. They, they all got triggered right there. And Jesus calls it out. Now you've hit a juncture. Now you've got to make a choice. What are you going to do about me given this teaching? What are you going to do about me given this teaching? In the guidebook this week, when we talk, I talk about the uh, parable about the soils and about the hard heart, and about how we have a, a sinful nature, a sinful nature that's naturally unbelieving. And Jesus goes on and he says, listen, you've got to expect this. You have to expect, given the fact that the flesh counts for nothing, which means words that originate from human sources, they're not going to get you where you need to go. And every once in a while, a teaching is going to come along, a word is going to come along from the Spirit, and because it's from the Spirit, it's going to confront your own flesh. It's going to confront your sinful nature. It's going to put you to the test, and you're not going to like it, and you're going to feel trapped. And that is sometimes what hard words do. See, Jesus is not on a self-improvement mission in the world. Jesus is on a rescue mission. Jesus is on a mission to call people who are naturally rebellious against God and God's call and who listen to other voices and who listen to words that appeal to our natural desires. We love the words that appeal to our natural desires. There's something else I'll reflect on this week in the guidebook. Is Remember when uh, the serpent went to Eve in the garden, right? And the way that he appealed was to say, did God really say that? Did God really? That's the danger with words. Did God really say that? It's always a question of our sinful human nature. Because we would rather put God's word to the test than be tested by God's word. We would rather put God's word to the test than be tested by God's word. And here's what happens. A word from God and the spirit of God confronts a part of ourselves that's enamored with another way of going, that has another desire. Eve, Eve looked at the fruit. She saw it was, it looked great. It looked great. She desired it. 
And then, you know, we complain. We, we complain about this hard teaching. Are you kidding me? There's no way I'm going to forgive that person. Give me a break. All the disciples complained when Jesus told them that they should not divorce. The complaints that happened when they're called to give sacrificially, the complaints of being asked to control our desire or our lust, the complaints of being told to deny ourselves and follow Jesus. There's not a single disciple in all of Scripture who did not raise a complaint at some point, at something Jesus said that was a hard word. And when we can't see how the words from Jesus or the words in Scripture are beneficial in our life and our lifetime, we turn away, oftentimes. We can turn away then. We test the word of God against our experience, our perception. We find it wanting. We set it aside. So Jesus calls out the complaining. He calls out the fact that hard sayings are going to shine a light on the places that the spirit and the flesh disagree. And we are still to come to Jesus in the midst of this battle. That's where he says, it's a gift from God if you're able to come to me. You can't do it yourself. Many on that day turned away. Many on that day did not follow. This is a painful day. It's painful to be in the midst of the grumbling. It's painful in the turning away. And then Jesus turns to the 12 and he says, are you leaving too? And there's a way of asking this where he's assuming their answer is going to be no, right? He asks the question knowing what the answer is going to be. That's the way it's written in the original language. This is the way you ask a question when you know full well. Every Sunday when Ron walks in and I say, Ron, will you do the benediction? I know Ron is going to say yes, right? So I can also say, Ron, you don't not want to do the benediction today, do you? And Ron will go, no, of course, I love to do the benediction at the end of the service, right? This is the way Jesus asks this question. So once again, he's giving a choice. There's a juncture here. But he asks it trusting in these 12. And Peter becomes the spokesperson. Here's Peter as the spokesperson for the 12. And he says two things. And I think this is really important for us. To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Here's the first thing I love. To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Peter doesn't say, of course we're not going. That makes perfect sense. They don't understand this teaching, right? Peter doesn't say, of course we're staying right here. We think everything you say is wonderful. No. He says, you have the words of eternal life. He recognizes the spirit of God in the words of Jesus. And so they stay put. And the guidebook this week also goes further into that characteristic that words of eternal life are words that the Holy Spirit of God and the words that come from God together invite us into eternal life. In John's gospel, those words are specifically and especially about the revelation of Jesus, the Son of God, whom God has sent to give eternal life to God's people. And since Jesus is the one sent with the words of eternal life, we also trust Jesus when he says that he did not come to abolish any of the other words entrusted to God's people, but to fulfill them. So we listen and hear the other testimonies to Jesus in these words of eternal life. See, here's the thing to remember. Jesus' words are not given to equip us for our best life now. That's not the case. Jesus' words are given for eternal life. And we tend to look for words that are going to help us figure out life here and now within the boundaries of here and now. I was reading one of the Desert Fathers this week, the Desert Mystics. This was a group who, in, when the whole church had gone, um, con, Santa, when the whole church had gone, Chris, when Christendom had been established, right? Now the church was the official, the official religion of the entire empire. And they looked at that and they said, this is so corrupt, this is so out of control, we're just leaving the city and we're going to the desert. And hopefully, we can go hear the voice of Jesus Christ, the words of eternal life, in such a way that we can pull the rest of this uh, corrupt and failing culture with us, right? And they were fascinated with eternity, the desert fathers and mothers, with eternity. One of them made this comment. He said, listen, you don't build your home on a bridge. We don't build our houses on bridges. We build our houses on land. This life is a bridge to eternity. 
And most of what we're looking for is home building plans and tips and tools and, and trade on how to build permanently in this life. You don't build your home on a bridge. What we need are the words of eternal life. And really, when you think about it, and we're going to look at this the next few weeks, a lot of Jesus' hard teachings make zero sense unless eternal life is the thing. Many of Jesus' teachings require a level of sacrifice and self-denial that is ridiculous unless the resurrection from the dead and eternal life and the kingdom of God are real. If there is no eternal life, these are ridiculous, ridiculous commands to follow. But, Peter says, you have the words of eternal life, words that the Spirit of God uses to, to grow eternal life in us. The testimony of all of Scripture is that human speech has a shelf life. Even the best of human wisdom isn't going to last. Some of the best and the greatest thinkers go longer but Jesus' words call us into relationships and teach and equip us to walk in the ways of God's eternal kingdom here and now. We don't build our houses on a bridge. God's word holds the power to generate life and produce fruit in the life of a mature believer. It invites us into God's family. It brings us into God's rest. It makes us wise unto salvation. In the guidebook this week, we list uh, five different ways that as we read the scriptures, we can look for these words of eternal lives. Asking, is there a sin here I need to confess? A promise to say yes to, an example to follow, a command to obey, or a truth to know about. And it struck me that in each one of those categories, in each one of those categories, there are hard teachings and there are moments of, of choosing whether we're going to say yes or not to the words of eternal life. I'll give you an example. I read a story this week about a, a fellow. It, this was in CT Magazine. And at the end, they always have these testimonies. I love reading the testimonies at the end. I especially love how they include it in their magazine. Because it's like on the very last page, they start the story. And then they say, to finish this story, go back one page. It's on the other side. It's just so clever. I really enjoy that. And it gets me every time. So I was reading about this fellow named Benjamin Buttle. Buttle or Buddy? Bud. Sorry, Benjamin Bud. And he grew up in a Christian family. They were constantly reading the Bible, reading Proverbs, things like this. And then he, um, this is one of these classic rock and roll and drugs testimonies, right? He went off and played, he started playing music in church, and then he liked playing the bass, and then he became a rock and roll player, and then he left the church, and then he got involved in drugs. This is why everybody doesn't want bass in the church, right? And, uh, and he got involved with drugs and things, and his life was, his life was spiraling out of control, uh, and he went to visit his grandmother, and her Bible's open on the table. And he just starts flipping in it. He goes back to Proverbs because he said, Proverbs is what my dad always read to us. And he began finding Proverbs like wine is a mocker and beer a brawler. These Proverbs start speaking and suddenly the Holy Spirit grabs these words, these hard words, and brings about a moment of clarity for him where he suddenly realizes it shines a light on the sin that has deceived him and taken him and is destroying him and gives him a way forward. This is what these hard words are intended to do, is give us a way forward out and through our sins. Sometimes it's the promises of God that aren't, they don't sound comforting, they sound like a hard word. I can remember for the many, many years that I was not married, and I would read the, the promise of God, it's not good for a person to be alone. And that was a hard word, that was not a comforting word to me. That was a word that brought up all sorts of anger and senses of betrayal with the Lord. That was a hard word. There are promises when Jesus promises, whatever you pray in my name, I will answer. It will be done. And we've prayed for things and for people we love. And those prayers have not been answered in that time. And we experience that promise as a hard word, as a difficult word. There are times that the examples in Scripture are, of people are they're encouraging. They're, they're inspirational. And then there's times that the examples are a hard word. They're a difficult example. They're not an example that, 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 that we want to follow. And, we, and it puts us under the test and we can feel ourselves fighting it. Or it puts our, our sinful world under the test. There are times, many times, the commands of Scripture. Sometimes 
The commands of Scripture lead us into life, and, there, and, and, there, and, and we experience that good word. And many times we experience the commands of Scripture as a hard word. Hard word. They put us to the test. It's the same with the truths. The guidebook this week wants to take a, is taking a, us into a deeper dive into the word of God in our lives. And notice something about Peter here. Peter didn't say, of course we're staying because all of these words make sense to us. He said, of course we're staying because these are the words of eternal life. And especially the teaching that Jesus gave just now about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, that made no sense at the time. We now know that we're talking about communion. We're talking about, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood shed for you. But for Peter and the other disciples at the time, this just sounded like cannibalism, exactly what the early church was accused of by those on the outside. Many times the hard words don't make sense at the time. So what do we do? Well, I think we follow the example of Peter and the 12. Where, who else are we going to go to? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. I love the way Peter says that. We've believed and come to know. There's a, I know I'm doing an awful lot of the original Greek today, right? I don't usually throw a pile that much in there. Every once in a while I have to remind you that I did spend 10 years getting a freaking PhD. But, the, but this is wonderful, this one. This is a particular way that you can use a verb in the Greek that we don't have in the English. And it's a, it, it means it's not, we, I not only did it, but I'm still doing it right? It's like saying, I got married and I'm still doing the marriage thing, right? I, I, I had a child, I became a parent 18 years ago, and I am still parenting. The, the verse is that verb that can do that for you, right? I started working when I was 14, and I'm still working. That's it. We have believed, and we're still believing. It's still going on. And I love the second one, and come to know. We know, and we're still figuring it out. We're still coming to know. This is discipleship. This is discipleship. We stay in the moment. Discipleship doesn't turn away from Jesus or the hard words, but it stays with Jesus, believing, okay, you've got the words of eternal life. Whether or not these make sense to me right now, we have believed and have come to know. We believe and we're still believing. We know and we're still knowing that you have the words of eternal life, that you are the Holy One of God. You're the one from God. To whom shall we go? In this uh, congregation, we are working on different discipleship markers and discovering together the reliable authority of the Bible in every aspect of life is one of those markers. Discovering together the reliable authority of the Bible in every aspect of life. That's one of those markers. This congregation for generations has stayed with Jesus and the words of eternal life in the scripture, and called and equipped others to do the same. I mean, we have this, this little room back here called Bopel Parlor. It's named after a pastor at this church, Bopel, and he used to run off Bible studies from the basement of this church and send them all over the U.S. This is a charism of this church. And we need to learn to invite others to stay with Jesus, the one with the words of eternal life, when the hard teachings are testing us. We're watching right now, we've got an entire generation that because of the hard teachings around sexual identity and sexual ethics, they're turning away. And the answer of some congregations is just to push those hard teachings harder. The answer of others' congregations is to say that that's not a hard teaching. We don't need to make that teaching so hard. We can make that teaching easier. I wonder and I would hope that the answer of this congregation could be to say, you know, we can live with each other in the middle of hard teachings. We have believed and have come to know. Jesus has the words of eternal life. So we can live with disagreeing on this hard teaching with each other while we pursue the one who has the words of eternal life. That, of course, words that come from God and the Spirit are going to be in conflict with our fallen human nature, and this isn't the first time we've hit them. We've hit them as a church when it comes to divorce. We've hit them as a church when it comes to women pastors. I'm standing right here. It's one thing to come and to see when we're curious and everything is new. It's another thing to continue to come and to see when the teachings are hard 
and they make us afraid or they threaten us. And you know me well enough to know that I do not back off of a hard teaching just because people are uncomfortable with it. But neither do I believe we should hinder people coming to Jesus who has the words of eternal life because we've made that hard teaching a litmus test and a gate that someone has to get through. The way forward, it seems to me, is the way that Peter describes in the second half of his declaration. We have believed and we have come to know, we are believing and we're still coming to know, that you are the Holy One of God. So how do we do this this week? First of all, I want to exhort you to make reading the Gospels a priority. Make sure you're reading something from the Gospels every single day. Make sure you're reading. You have time. You're scrolling on your phones. You're watching TV. You're reading books. You have time to read from the Gospel. Don't kid yourself. Read from the Gospels every single day. All of those other words, they've got a shelf life. You need the words of eternal life. So do I. Read from the Gospels every single day. And the second, I want to exhort you to listen to the entire witness of Scripture, not just the parts that you like. Listen to the entire witness of Scripture. Let Scripture test you. Let it make you uncomfortable. Let the Holy Spirit take these words and challenge places you didn't even know sin had its claws in you. Read the entire one. And then in the hard teaching, let's invite others to Jesus and his words of eternal life together. Let's not reject that hard teaching out of hand. Let's not make the hard teaching a rite of passage. Let's come back to the risk of saying yes to Jesus and the very real possibility that the words from the Spirit will test our behavior and our thinking, and the outcome of that testing will be eternal life. Please pray with me.